Mount Olive Baptist Church Woodbridge. It's not the building. It's the people that make the church. People that care for one another. People that share with one another. People, people who, who love, love one, one another. another. Come, experience, connect with us. Mount Olive Baptist Church. Feel the love. church family and good morning god bless you and we want to welcome everyone who's joining with us this morning by way of live streaming we bless god for your being here with us we just honor you for taking the time not counting robbery to join with us in a word from the lord himself let's look to the lord in prayer god our heavenly father it's yet another time lord that you have allowed us to come together in the name of Jesus. We come this morning, Lord God, as we always do, in the name of the one that is able, the one high God who sits high and looks low. So we thank you, Father, for 
inhabiting our praises today. We thank you for giving us this day, Lord God, to sing praises unto your name. And now, Lord God, we pray that as we sit in our tent doors, that you will, Lord God, speak to our hearts a word, Lord, that you would have us to know this day. So we thank you and we honor you. And always in the name of Jesus that we ask it all. Amen. And praise the Lord. Again, what a blessing and a joy to be here with you today. God is so good. So I want to invite your attention this morning to a very familiar passage of Scripture, one which we tend to read very often at this time of the year during this season, and that's out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And our hearts are blessed in this wise. Free from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Because there was no room for them in the inn. May God bless the reading, hearing, and always the obeying of his word. The one line in this account of Luke concerning the birth of Jesus Christ, I want to concentrate on that very last, the last part of verse 7. There was no room for them in the inn. And I want to talk about that. No room in the inn. And this grabs our attention this morning as we are reading the account of the birth of Jesus Christ. So Luke gives us in detail the birthplace of Jesus Christ. As we all know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But this is not the first time we've ever come to know where the Christ, the Messiah, would be born because the great prophet, the Old Testament prophet Micah, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, had already prophesied that the coming Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So we're not here by accident. We are here in Bethlehem by God's design to satisfy God's purposes. See, when it comes to God, nothing just happens. It's all been spoken before God created a world. So God had already ordained that the Christ would be born in Bethlehem. So how do we get here? So you see how history plays out according to God's purposes. So the decree of Caesar Augustus went out. It was time for the census. And so he had required everyone to register for the census in the city of their ancestors, which, of course, forced Joseph and Mary to come to Bethlehem because they were of the tribe of Judah and the family of David. And therefore, they must go and register for the census at Bethlehem. And we find this, Luke summarizes this in chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. So we see where he tells that, where Luke introduces us to this background, but remember, already spoken in Micah, that, it would, that the time came that a decree went out and all had to be taxed in the city in which they had been born. So we have Joseph and Mary here by the census requirement to register. So just think about the crowd now in Bethlehem. So you have to put this thing into a historical perspective. So you got a lot of people in Bethlehem. Everyone who had been born in Bethlehem now had to return to Bethlehem 
to register for the census. And what happens? So Joseph and Mary, I guess, running late, get to Bethlehem when it's already filled up. So it wasn't that people are necessarily being cruel not to, you know, because unlike today, we don't have uh, 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 reservation systems, if you will, where you could call and reserve things. So they arrived late, and because of that, there was no available space for them to lodge. But even though the place was filled with people, yet you would think that out of concern and kindness, seeing this very pregnant woman, amen, that somebody would have had pity on her and would have said, child, come on in here. I'm not going to lie. While we may not necessarily have room, I'm going to make some room for you. Huh? But, but that didn't happen. You would think that somebody would have made room somewhere in their home for them. There was no room anywhere. And during this time, Mary had the baby. <laughs> she went into labor and actually has this baby, has to deliver her child. And so I have often asked myself the question, why? Why would no one make room? I mean, they, 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 they see her. They see she's, I, to use my language, very pregnant. And the Bible uses the word, her days were accomplished, meaning her pregnancy was coming to delivery. They could see that happening, and yet no one said, Sir, bring her in here that she might deliver her child. So I thought about that. I thought about that. And I said, now, hmm, look like somebody would have let her in, but yet nobody did. So what were the dynamics in place in that day, kind of like today, that would cause people not to have a loving attitude toward Joseph and Mary? Well, let's take a look at it. What was her problem? Simple. She was pregnant. There you have it. She was pregnant. That within itself was the problem. Now, they weren't strangers. People knew of them. And you know what they suspected? Just like we do today. Amen. We just don't say it out loud. We think possibly Mary was fooling around. Because mm -hmm. we struggle with this. Holy Ghost conception, don't we? You don't have to say amen. See? Mm hmm So you telling me she knows not a man, had not been involved with any man, and not even with the guy that's with her. Wink, wink. Uh-huh. So we suspect that her pregnancy was illegitimate. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Pastor, how are you going to walk yourself back into an illegitimate pregnancy. Were they not, according to the scripture, betrothed or espoused to each other? Absolutely. But they had not gotten married yet. It's like what we call engaged. They were in an engagement period. And there are certain obligations, of course, during this betrothal period. So you can Google all this for yourself. But there's one thing that you cannot do during the betrothal period. The man cannot know her. She cannot know him. And we know what that means. They cannot be intimately involved. Cannot. That is something that was reserved for marriage. And they were not married yet. And so no self-respecting virgin Jewish woman, maiden, would ever be sexually involved with any man, especially one that's betrothed, until her wedding day. So they were not husband and wife. So, as many of us would have probably concluded, since we know the customs of, you know, and we know how we feel today about people who are not married having children, you know, 
Now, we tend to be, I would think, a little bit more tolerant today than what we used to be. You know, uh, in the olden days, you know, people didn't take kindly to that. Oh, when they found out that a young woman was pregnant and was not married, oftentimes the young lady would have to leave the community. Hmm? And if she was a quote-unquote church girl, help me now, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of the younger people may not. They put you out of the church. You had to leave. Oh, yes, indeedy. Yes, indeedy. So that's when I'm from North Carolina. So that's when all of a sudden a young lady would have to do what? Go to New York. <laughs> Amen. She would go to New York. And then she could represent herself as anybody that she needed to be in New York. And then interestingly enough, when she would return to North Carolina, coming with her would be her cousin <laughs> huh? or her niece or her nephew, but not her child. Amen. Because she had to come back and live in that community. You had, had smudged the family name. You had sinned. Come on, you don't want to call it. That was a sin for a young lady to be impregnated and not married. And she would bear that stigma for the rest of her life. You remember the book, Scarlet, the Scarlet A, where they would call, mm -hmm. yeah, so you mark now. And from here on out, everybody is what when they see you? Psst, 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 psst. Child, that's her. Psst, 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 psst. The whispering would start. I'm talking about no room in the end. So either Mary had been sleeping around or Joseph on the sly had actually impregnated her. Either way, it didn't matter who had impregnated her. The point was that no one wanted her in their home, period. No room in the end because I ain't going to tolerate that type of behavior. So I would demonstrate my lack of tolerance by telling, I would do what, I would turn you out. You can't stay here because she was officially a sinner woman. Did you catch that? Now we all hold, quote, unquote, the Virgin Mary in high esteem. But when they looked at her in that day, she was a sinner woman. You can't stand up and tell them about some Holy Ghost. Yeah, we know about the Holy Ghost. You see, in those days, see, one of the things they would do, in case you didn't know some of their culture, that's why when I teach the Bible, I tell people, you have to research the culture, the history that sits behind Scripture. So in those days, one way you could tell if a boy was illegitimate, is you could, you could not name him after his father. So what they would do is Jesus, if Jesus had been the son of Joseph, okay, they would have called him Jesus Ben, B-E-N, which is a Hebrew word for son of. He would have been Jesus, son of Joseph. That's how he would have been known. But Jesus, because they considered him illegitimate, he was called Jesus of Nazareth. You would take the name of the town where you had been born. So Jesus was never called the son of Joseph. The best they would do is call him a son of Nazareth, which is to suggest that Jesus was the product of an illegitimate birth. Amen, somebody. They marked him from his birth. And in the midst of his ministry, see, you know, people knew Jesus. Many a time when people said, who is that boy? And start, they would say, oh, that's that boy from Nazareth. That's Jesus of Nazareth. They didn't say Jesus, the son of, you know, bestowing some honor upon the family name. Oh, no, they, they had to quickly tag him and anybody associated with him. If you look in John chapter 8, and you don't have to turn there now, but in John chapter 8, we see an instance where Jesus is talking to the Jews of that day, the Pharisees, where he talks about God being his father. 
and they say, we have Abraham as our father. Oh, you do. And Jesus goes on to tell them, it's no way. And then to let Jesus know, we know who you are. In code, here is how it reads in the King James. We, these are the Pharisees talking, we be not born of fornication. Which is to say to Jesus, we are not of an illegitimate birth as you are. That's what they were telling him. We know that you are of an illegitimate birth because you were born out of fornication. I'm talking about the quote unquote Virgin Mary, y'all. Oh, yeah. They weren't going to let Jesus forget it. So you see, they said, we know why nobody let you in that night. Because we don't hobnob with sinners. You know how they always, you know, talk about being clean. So they were never going to be found in the company of a sinner. So think about it now. Now, what kind of God do we have that would allow his only begotten son to born to be born under such suspicion, such suspicion. You think God knew this? Is it possible that something got by God? He didn't know that. His son, whom they, he wanted to be highly exalted, would instead be brought down and despised, rejected and despised, even before he was born. Not only were they tagging his mother, they tagging him. You are born of fornication. You are an illegitimate child. And you dare say you are born of the father and God is your father. How dare you? We know. You know how it is once we get saved. People remember where you came from. And they can always tell you what you used to be. Never, never blessing you to be who God transformed you to be. But they always talk about, child, you know, that's that boy, you know, Houston. And you know, his mama. You think God doesn't know that the world hasn't changed one lick? Because human nature doesn't change. It was mean spirited then and it's mean spirited now. Just can't find one good thing to say about. Couldn't say one good thing about this young pregnant woman. Couldn't have compassion and mercy on her. The best they could do was be whisperers and, and gossip about her. And the fact that Jesus was a product of fornication. Amen. I know I'm somebody having a fit this morning. You're going to talk about the son of God being born out of unsavory conditions during this holy of time. But God knew that Jesus would be born and accused of being illegitimate. Does that make sense now? Does that make sense? He knew that. So Jesus was despised and rejected from his birth. He hadn't done anything good. He hadn't done anything bad. He had just been born. Does that make sense? Y'all know where the Bible talks about Jacob and Esau, and God said, Jacob, I love, and Esau, I hate. And the Bible goes on to say, and God spoke these words while the boys were still in their mother's womb, neither having done any good or bad. So here's Jesus in his mother's womb, ain't even born, and already the world has done what? Rejected him. His own creation had already despised him. And rejected. Think about it. Jesus was despised and rejected upon birth, and he was despised and rejected on the cross. Oh, did somebody catch that? Thank you, Jesus. You see, but we have to step back and ask a question now. And I'm not to insult anyone's intelligence this morning. So here's the question, and you can answer it in the privacy of your own home. Who carried Jesus into Bethlehem? His mother. He was still within her, right? So the answer is, who is Mary? 
And Mary was rejected because of the sin people thought that she had already committed in her life. Thus, people had no room for Jesus because they never had room for sinners. Does that make sense? But sinners, interestingly, are who Jesus came to save. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. And sinners were the ones that God would use to take the gospel of Jesus Christ forward. So who did God use to take Jesus forward? A sinner. A woman who had already been declared to be a sinner. Huh? She would be the one who would be the, the missionary, if you will, to carry the gospel forward, and his name was Jesus. Because Jesus, the gospel is to be spread by people who are what? Imperfect and rejected of this world. After accepting Jesus Christ into my life, I found many of what I thought were my friends started to leave me quickly. I was rejected by the very same people that I used to drink with and hobnob with. Now I look around and I'm saying, where are they? Despised and rejected because I had now become a bearer of the gospel of Jesus Christ by accepting him. My point is this. God can use and will use anyone who's willing to tell others about Jesus. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done or where you've been. God can and he will use you if you let him. Isn't that what Mary did? Mary allowed God to use her. She didn't have to. She has a free will. But when the Holy Ghost spoke to her, Mary told him what? I don't understand all that you're saying to me in our language. She said, but if God said it, so let it be done. God said, I like that. I like that. Now, I can use that person. Amen. And he did. What else? What else could have possibly have happened to not allow room for Jesus to be found in Bethlehem? Think about babies. Everyone that I know, except one of my sisters, I have a sister who's gone to be with the Lord, and she'll have talked to him about that. But everybody thinks that babies are cute. But my one sister, she used to tell me, Clyde Jr., babies are not cute. I told the girl, don't you tell that to no mother and expect to live. <laughs> and she explained to me, she said, they are wrinkly. And they all, you know, and I said, okay. But she's with the Lord now. But we believe babies are cute. But there's one thing that we know about a baby, as cute as they are when they smile, they can't do a thing for you. Not a single solitary thing. A baby can't do anything. You are the one who has to do everything. You got to feed them. You got to burp them. You got to change them and do everything else that's needed to sustain their lives. So when it comes to Jesus, similarly, a lot of people don't have room for Jesus in their lives because they don't see him as doing anything for them. What is he going to do for me? That's ultimately our criteria for determining whether or not we will have room in our, in our lives for Jesus. What's in it for me? I tell people that's the story that, that Jesus had with Peter. What's in it for me? There are a lot of people who don't accept God's Savior into their lives because they absolutely think they don't need Jesus in their life. But John said it this way. He came unto his own creation, and his own creation did what? Received him not. Why wouldn't people receive Jesus and allow him to have place in their lives? Because they felt they didn't need him. They had other ways to go to heaven. So they didn't see a need to accept Jesus Christ as a way to heaven. In fact, Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 3, said what about the people of that day? He said, they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, went about establishing their own righteousness and not submitting themselves unto the righteousness of God. John also goes on and he said, but I'm going to tell you, but as many as received him, so not everyone rejects him. 
as many as received them, he said, God will give you the power to become the children of God. King James has the sons of God. Better understood, to become children of God. To those who do what? Believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, some people think that they can get into heaven because of who they are and the bloodline in which they have descended from. In those days, if you were born of a Jewish family, you were considered a Jew. My mom and dad, that's what they were saying about Abraham. Abraham has this relationship with God, therefore, because I'm born of Abraham, therefore, I am a child of God. You automatically would become part of the old covenant that had been established because of the bloodline of your ancestors. But John is explaining that it doesn't work that way. I don't care who your mom and your daddy is. I don't care who came over on the Mayflower. I don't care whether they dragged you here from Africa or you sailed in pomp and splendor from Europe. The only way that you can become a child of God is by accepting Jesus Christ and making room in your end. It's the only way it can happen. I care who you are. I don't care where you came from. God says, I don't know anything about any of that. I just know those who know my son. And if you don't know my son, then I don't know you. Amen, somebody. And John goes on to say, you can't get into heaven by the will of the flesh. Man can't think his way. That, that, that's the story of Nimrod. You can go back and study that for yourself one day, of building a stairway to heaven. That's what that story was all about. A person can't decide they will be accepted by God because of how nice they are or how righteous they are. People think that. They believe that if they do enough good things, God will be impressed and they'll be allowed to walk right past the pearly gates. They believe their own self-righteousness will get them into heaven. In fact, they feel like they deserve to be in heaven and God couldn't keep them out if he wanted to because they have already bought their ticket because of who they are. But John says you can't get into heaven by the will of man. Believe it or not, there are many who teach that you can make that choice for your children. You can't pray your children into heaven. You can't make them children of God. The best thing we can do is pray for them and hope God continue to send someone with the message to lead them to Jesus Christ. The parents today... Now, I know I'm going to insult somebody. We rush off and have babies baptized. We have them sprinkled. And we believe that that makes the child magically somehow a child of God. It doesn't work that way. John says you can't do it that way. The will of the parent, the will of the grandparents, or the parents can't get someone else into heaven. It's all about your own personal decision to belong to Jesus Christ. Period. That's what it has always been. That's what it's always going to be. So if Jesus is going to have a place in your life, in your end, then you are the end keeper, and you'll make the decision to let him in. Or you can do what? Put up a sign that says what? No vacancies here. And turn him away. The choice is up to you. Becoming a child of God is very simple. You only have to make that decision for Jesus Christ. You have to believe that Jesus died for your sins. You, not someone else. No one else can, can pray the sinner's prayer for you. You have to own your own sins. You have to accept that your sin would rob you of heaven. So you need to do what? Repent of your sins. You have to confess that Jesus will now be your Lord and Master. And you decide to be buried with him in baptism and be raised up as a whole new creation. You have to do that, not anybody else. So ultimately, it wasn't them who didn't allow Jesus to be born in a place that evening. It's you and I who don't allow Jesus to be born when he comes to our door and wants to be delivered in our place. That's what we're doing. This isn't some fairy tale to, that we speak of because it's December. 
This is the experience that God desires for us every day of our lives. That's what preaching and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Because whosoever receives him into their life, into their heart, Jesus will be born. You'll be born of God and you'll be transformed into, his, into the image of his son. And you shall call his name Jesus. Because there was no room in the inn, you have to understand that this is God's plan of salvation for all of us. God planned it that way. Human nature will always do what? Reject Jesus Christ. Human nature despises the truth of God. But as many as do what? Receive the truth of God. Shall be born. Huh? Isn't that what it's all about? This isn't about Jesus coming into the world going to a Jew. This is about Jesus coming into my life. This is about Jesus knocking at my door and asking for me to let him in. This is about Clyde Ellis. This is about you. You don't have to look around for some innkeeper to blame for that night in Bethlehem. All you have to do is look in the mirror and you'll see the innkeeper who turned Mary away that night. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And Jesus is knocking at my door and says that if you receive me, if you allow me to come into your heart, because this is the door. He said, if you open the door, when I knock, when you open the door, I'll come in. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So when you hear Jesus is standing at your door, open up the door and let him come in. Cry out that Jesus is your Lord. It was by God's will that he decided to come into the world that way and not in some pompous castle someplace where the world is heralding him as king. Jesus chose these humble surroundings and made his entrance into the world as you and I would. He chose to have Jesus born in a manger in an obscure town named Bethlehem. And though he was Lord of all, though he was the mighty God, yet he identified himself as what? The son of man. And he did that so that he could do what? Identify with our human nature. And God and Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 8 verse 20 made a statement though. Even though being the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, even though he had created all things. Yet he said what? The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So it wasn't just that night in Bethlehem. It's every day that we live in this body. God is always looking for a place to call home. And when Adam made that decision to expel Jesus out of his life, he expelled God out of his life in the Garden of Eden. Ever since then, God has constantly walked this earth to and fro looking for a home. And the place he wants to dwell is in the hearts and minds of people. Jeremiah told him that the day would come when I would do what? Dwell in your inward parts. He wasn't talking about a physical building, a holiday inn, hotel, motel. Y'all remember the song, Holiday Inn? Jesus isn't looking for that. You are the holiday inn. You are the place that God wants to dwell in. And he says, I search this earth high and low, constantly seeking for what? A place. The old songwriter said what? He's just looking for a home. Huh? And the place that he wants to tabernacle is in you and I. He said this about the foxes and the birds to convince those who expected worldly splendor. See, you got people who think that because Jesus Christ is in their life, everything is hunky-dory. It doesn't work that way. But by becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, Jesus styled himself as the son of man. And this was not in contradiction to the fact that he is what? The son of God. He was simply saying, I am Emmanuel. I am God in human form. I am God in the flesh. And when I came into this world, I did not take upon me the nature of angels, but I took upon me what? The nature of Abraham. 
which is to say I am a human being, that I might do what? Identify with my brothers and sisters, that I might do what? Experience temptations. The Bible teaches us that Jesus lived in this world and was tempted, did you hear me? And was tempted in every point as we, we are. So God, through Jesus Christ, knows. Oh, yes, he does. God knows. How can God know? Because Jesus has been here and done that. Did you hear me? So therefore, the Bible says he's able to do what? To sympathize with us, which means what? To stand in the shoes of. Jesus said, Clyde, I know. I know. I know. I know about the hard times. I know what you're going through. I've seen your ups. I've seen your downs. I've seen your frustration. I've seen your worries. Well, how could you know that? He said, because I walked in your shoes. Meaning what? I, too, was a human being. Jesus is truly God as well as being a man. He is Emmanuel. He's the God with us in our nature. God manifested in his flesh. And since he is and has lived as we are living, therefore we can do what? Trust him. The Old Testament writers saw this and they prophesied of this. They saw this birth and they said that the Emmanuel, they called him the Messiah. David said the Messiah and he said the Messiah, the son of man. You can read that for yourself in Psalm 80 verse 17. He didn't call him the son of God. He called him the son of man. He knew that the Messiah would do what? Tabernacle in our human body. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, saw the same thing and referred to the Messiah as son of man. Jesus Christ identified with our humanity. And that's why he went on Calvary's cross. The whole world is his. Therefore, Jesus could be in what? In want of anything as God. He could never want anything. He's God. But yet as man, Jesus became poor that we might be rich. Nor should this be any difficulty for a Jew in that day. Because they themselves saw that the Messiah would be called the son of man. They even said that there is no place in which he can sit down. Speaking to that birth. Speaking to the ministry that he would have. He would be rejected and despised from his birth to the cross. God had already spoken. So although we are looking at Matthew chapter 8, but the context of Matthew chapter 8 is Isaiah 53. Because the Bible teaches us as a man, Jesus bore our griefs and our sorrows. Yet we ourselves did what? Esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, The chastisement for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, by his stripes, we are healed. People probably thought that the son of man was just only a mere man. But when Jesus spoke and when Jesus acted, he did so with the authority of the almighty God that he was. The son of man was not a nationalistic messiah of Jewish expectations. But the Savior of the world was unique among every man who ever walked this earth. And that's what that word only begotten means. M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E-S. Only begotten. That's what that means. That he was unique among every man who ever walked this earth. And he came to this earth in a humble beginning of being born to a virgin in a stable. Amen. Jesus came into the world rejected. He came into the world despised because of his birth to a sinner woman, a virgin. And he died on the cross, rejected of heaven and rejected of earth. The world wanted him crucified, and the Father did what? Would forsake him. He went out exactly as he came in. No room in his own creation. No room in the end. No place to lay his head. The one who had created all was despised and rejected. 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power. Exousia. That's not dunamis. I know we always want to translate the word power as dunamis. But the word there in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, is E-X-O-U-S-I-A-S, exousia. That's the Greek word for it, meaning authority to become the sons or children of God. I bless God for Jesus Christ. I bless God for his plan. And so I now know that I can open my door and afford the son of man, the son of God, to have a place to rest his head. And that resting place is in my soul. I bless God for you today. And I pray that what we have tried to share has in some small way blessed your heart and helped to open your understanding as to God's plan of salvation that we're going to see being played out throughout this month that we all call the Christmas season. I just thank God for your presence today, and I pray that as you prepare to go that God will continue to bless you. This morning you have heard the word of God. It's as simple as this. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says simply, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, he says, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So if you're here today, and wherever you may be, as we are connected today virtually, and God has now spoken to your heart, and God says, today, Mr. Innkeeper, do you have a place for the Savior to be born? Do you have any room in your inn? Is there any place in your heart, in your mind, in your soul for the Savior of the world? For unto us is born a Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. And if you are being led by God now to make that decision, let us join you in making that, that decision. Let us pray with you for that decision. And if you would call 703-494-4466, we're going to join you on that call. And we want to talk with you and pray with you about your decision to open your heart to Jesus Christ. And if God is also placing in your spirit today and knocking on your door and is inviting you to join with our church family, I just want you to know very simply that we would love to have you as a part of our church family. Here at Mount Olive, God knows we will. And again, I invite you to dial the same number, 703-494-4466, and let us join you in praying about your decision to join with us here at Mount Olive. And then, of course, this morning, if you need prayer, and God knows there's so much going on in this world, it's kind of hard to not have something to pray about. But if you need prayer today, and you need someone to pray with you, you need someone to pray for you, I want you to know that we here at Mount Olive will be so blessed of God to join you on our prayer line. You could simply dial 351-999-4165. The prayer warriors of Mount Olive, the elders of Mount Olive, the Bible teaches us to call for the elders, our deacons, our deaconesses, our ministers of the gospel. We'll join you on the line, and we're going to pray with you. We're going to pray for you, for whatever it is that concerns you this day. Amen. Again, we just bless God for your joining us today. I am so honored and so blessed that you chose to praise and worship the Lord Jesus Christ with us today. And my prayer always, of course, is that as God allows you to continue to tabernacle in this body, that he will be with you and protect you every step of the way in your life. Father in heaven, we come, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, just grateful and thankful, Lord God, for the word that you have given us. We pray, Lord God, that the word speaks to our heart, and today that doors are opening, that we have a welcome sign out. We've put the welcome mat out that says, Jesus, come into my life. And I pray, Father, that as the doors open, I'm confident that you are going to step in and find residence in the end. So, Father, we bless you today for the word. We bless you for the hearer. Now be with us, Lord, as we 
leave from this assembled place in terms of our, 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 our live streaming experience, but be with us in everything that we do and watch over us until you allow us to come back together again is always our prayer. And this we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus and always for thy mercy and sake. Then wherever you are this morning, right where you are, join me in saying amen, amen, and amen. May you go in peace. God be with you.